Today we're going to talk about exponential functions. So we've all heard about viral videos, right? So we have somebody who makes a video and a few people watch it, then a lot more people watch it, right? And it just expands like crazy. But it's not related to a virus. So what's the connection? Well, the connection is the growth and how the shape of the graph looks when we look at something that starts really small and expands really quickly, like you can see in this picture of coronavirus data. So our definition of exponential growth is that a function that could be written as f of x equals b to the x, where b is greater than zero and b is not equal to one, is an exponential function. What's important here is this number b at the bottom. It's just a number. It has to be positive, but it can be a fraction, it can be a decimal, it can be anything we want as long as it's not equal to one. So as we first start to talk, I'm gonna break it into two types. I'm gonna talk about things where b is greater than one and then what happens when b is between zero and one. So before we get there, let's just say what is an exponential function and what is not. I have a where f of x equals three to the x. So what I'm looking for when I look at these functions is that this base is a number and the exponent is a variable. So this makes this an exponential function. When I look at my second case, x to the fourth, the base is x, that's a variable, and the exponent is a number. That's not what we want, that's not exponential. In C, where I have h of x is 100 times 0.25 to the x, the 0.25 is my base, that's good, it's a number, and the exponent is a variable, so that is exponential. In D, I have y equals 5x plus 6. Here what I see is I have 5x. If I had an exponent, it would be 1, but that exponent would be a number, not a variable, and we already know that 5x plus 6 is a line, so that is not exponential. In E, I see y equals negative 2x squared minus 4x plus 7, so my exponent 2 is a constant. It doesn't change. We also know this is a quadratic, so that would not be exponential. And then the last one, y equals 1 6 to the x. 1 6 is my base, that's a number. x is a variable, that's great. So this would also be exponential. So let's look farther into this. Let's pick an easy one, like f of x equals 2 to the x. And let's look at some powers that I'm going to put in a table. From the table, we'll go ahead and graph it. Let's take this quick reminder that when I have anything to the zero, it's going to be one. The only restriction is we can't have zero to the zero. So zero to the zero is not one. Don't even worry about what that is. But just know anything to the power zero is one. Another quick reminder is if I have a negative exponent, I'm going to write that as a fraction. So remember, we're going to flip it over, still do the same power, but it just becomes in the denominator now. So when I start, I have 2 to the 0, and we just said that was going to be 1. Then I'm going to have 2 to the 1, that's going to be 2, and then 2 squared, which will be 4. We know these negatives mean just turn that same thing into a fraction, so I'm going to have 1 half for 2 to the negative 1, and then 2 to the negative 2, I'm going to make that 1 over 4. Of course, you're going to put these in your calculator. Um, you can do positives, negatives, whatever you want with exponents in your calculator, that's fine. Pay attention in your homework if it asks you for a fraction or if it allows you to put it in as a decimal just to be careful and get the right answer. All right. So let's take those numbers that we have. Let me just rewrite them here so we can easily see them and let's plot those on this graph. So I have 0, 1, I have 1, 2, 2 is at 4, and then you're just going to have to do the best that you can with the negative 1 being a half and the negative 2 being a fourth. Then we want to connect those in a smooth curve. What's going to happen is I can see on the right it's going to go up, up, up. On the left, right, it's going to go closer and closer to the x-axis. It is never going to hit zero. What it would be is, see how it went one half, and then one one fourth. It would go one eighth, one over 16, one over 32. We would keep dividing by two, so these numbers are gonna stay positive. They're just gonna be really small, really close to zero. So let's talk about some characteristics of two to the x, but it'll be same for anything where b is greater than one. 
If I look for an x-intercept, hopefully what you see is it's not actually going to touch the x-axis. So my x-intercept, the answer is there's not one. If I look for a y-intercept, hopefully we can see that it's crossing at 0, 1. And that will be the same no matter what the b is. If I plug in 1, and I'm going to write this a weird way for you. I'm going to write b to the 1 to show you I get b out because I want this kind to be generic for any function that I would give you. Hopefully you can see this function is only getting bigger as I read from left to right. So these exponential functions are getting really large. Again, this is b greater than 1. This one, y equals 3 to the x. What I want to convince you of is you don't need a lot of points to graph exponential functions. What I want to do is plug in 0. So I have 3 to the 0, which is 1. I can plug in 1. So 3 to the 1 gives me 3. And if you want to, we could go ahead and put in um, 3 squared, which is 9. So I have 2, 9. Just to have a number to the left of the y-axis, let's go ahead and plug in negative 1. And that gives me 1 third. So I'm going to take these points and I'm going to plot them on my xy axis and just think about the fact that it's not going to go below 0. So if I put in 0, I'm going to get 1. When I plug in 1, I'm going to get 3. When I plug in 2, I'm going to get 9. And then I had at negative 1, it's really small at a third. And then once again, I just graph it and I know the shape it's going to be. So I have this curve. This is also why I use technology. It looks prettier than when I graph. All right, let's look again. This time I switched to 6 to the x. But this time I said, let's just put in three numbers. That's going to be plenty for us to be able to see this graph. So I'm going to start with, if I put in 0, I know 6 to the 0 is 1. So I have 0, 1. If I plug in 1, I get 6 to the 1 which is 6. And then if I plug in negative 1, I get 6 to the negative 1, which is 1 over 6. Now notice this time I didn't bother with squared because 6 squared is 36. That's really a lot to put on this little graph. So let's try this. I'm plugging in 0. It gives me 1. If I plug in 1, it gives me 6. And then at negative 1, I'm at 1, 6. So again, I know it's going to be a curve. And what's happening is just it's kind of a quicker curve the bigger the base is. This time I have 1 half to the x. Notice this 1 half is between 0 and 1. So this is going to look a little different when I graph it. But still, let's do the same thing we've been doing. If I do 1 half to the 0, I know that's going to give me 1. 1 half to the first power is still a half. A half squared is 1 fourth. Now this negative is going to flip it over. So if I flip 1 half over, I get 2. And then 1 half to the negative 2 is going to give me 4. I'm going to put those points on my graph. So I have 0 gives me 1, 1 gives me a half, 2 gives me a fourth, but the negative 1 is 2, and negative 2 is 4. Now when I connect the dots, I can see this function is going down. So there is this slight difference of what happened. It still looks like a curve, but instead of increasing from left to right, we are decreasing. And that's because my base was between 0 and 1. Let's look at another one between 0 and 1. I have a fourth. So for the fourth, I'm going to plug in 0. It's going to give me 1. I'm going to plug in 1. It's going to give me 1 fourth. Really, the only other thing I need to do for this one is let's plug in negative 1, and we know that's going to flip that over and make it a 4. So I have 0, 1, 
one is really small at a fourth and negative one much bigger at four. And that way I can see this decreasing curve that's coming from having this base that's between zero and one. Let's summarize what we've talked about. We have two cases for exponential functions, one when b is greater than one and one when b is between zero and one. When b is greater than one, we have an increasing function. It's gonna look like this nice little curve. You're gonna find it by plugging in zero, you'll get one. You'll plug in one and you'll get whatever the base was. If instead you get something between zero and one, you know it's going to be decreasing. So the curve goes in the opposite direction. You'll still put in zero, one. You'll also put in one to get B. But just to make this look the way we really want to see it, you're going to also put in negative one and it's going to flip that base over. So three points when I have something between zero and one and really only two points if I have something greater than one. So let's look at this where I made it a little bit bigger. I have 300 times one fifth to the X. We said, well, let's plug in zero. Plugging in zero says I have 300 times one fifth to the zero Again, use your calculators. The 1 fifth to 0 is going to be 1, so that 300 will just be 300. If you want to plug in 1, so then you have 300 times 1 fifth to the first power. Well, that's going to work like 300 divided by 5. We're going to get 60. And just in case we want to make it a little bigger, let's put negative 1 on the other side. So we have 300 times one-fifth to the negative one, that's going to end up flipping that one-fifth over and we end up with 1,500. Use your calculators, absolutely fine. So what I want to make sure I do on this one is scale it differently. I have these big numbers that are coming out, primarily like I'm looking at 1,500 at negative one. So maybe I want to call these in hundreds. way up here is 15 so there's my negative 1 is 1500 at 0 it was 300 and at 1 it was only 60 so I have this graph coming down and it's going to level out along the x-axis so Let's look at an application. In this application, don't worry about writing it down. We're going to come back and do another problem like it at the end of this lecture. So what I looked up is Land Rovers. They have a depreciation rate of about 16%. And if it depreciates 16%, it means it keeps 84% of its value. What did I do? I did 100 minus 16 is 84. The Land Rover I looked up cost $107,330. And I said, well, it's losing value or at 16%, so it's retaining that 84% of its value. So I could come up with this model, which is exponential, and shows me what happens over the years as we buy this Land Rover. So I'm gonna look at what would be the value if I have this car zero years, one years, two, three, four, or five, and I'm just gonna plug those numbers into this function and see what I get. So here I already put it in, just put it into my calculator and said, all right, we bought it at 107,330. After one year, it's worth 90,157. At two years, it's worth 75,732. And three years, it's worth 63,515. After four years, it's 53,437. And then in five years, it's worth 44,887. What I wanted to show you is what does that look like as a graph? And it looks like it's crazy going down, almost like a line, but it's not linear. To really show you the bigger idea that it's not linear, I'm just going to add a few more years. So I added 10 years, 15 years, 25 years, and 35 years. And then when you do that, you can see this value is exponential, right? It's going down. And why did it go down? Because we had that 0.84 to the x, right? This is less than 1. So something between zero and one is gonna give me this decreasing going down over time. And after 35 years, 
this Land Rover is worth $574. What we see is it gets closer and closer to zero, but it won't really hit zero. For some of our other examples, I need to introduce to you a new number, and this number is called E. Um, and what's it used for? It's for things that grow every second of every minute of every day of every year. We say this is continuous growth. And it could be growth or it could also be decay. So if it's getting bigger, we call that growth. If it's getting smaller, we call it decay. So examples are population, bacteria, inflation, radioactive decay. Now this number E has a value. It's about 2.71828. And I pulled up a few different calculators that I have to show you where it's located because sometimes that can take you a while to find it. So I'm gonna pop through a couple really quick. This is the TI-30 XTUS, and you can see in the first column, it's the third button down. It's on top of a button called LN. We're going to be talking about that next time. So I can see this E to the X right there. If instead you had a graphing calculator, same kind of thing, we want to locate it. Again, the first column, but it's farther down. Once again, related to the LN button, it's just the second of the LN. And then I also pulled up a Casio just because I know everybody has different things. On the Casio, it's in the first column. So it's on the left side on the TIs, it's on the right side on the Casio. And one more time, it's related to the LN. And every time it's shown as an exponential, it says E to something or E to the X. So it's no, it's gonna be exponential. Because it is a number, it's 2.71828, I know if I hit e to the x, it should look like it's going up. But you heard me say words like depreciation or decay, so what's it gonna do to go down? It'll have a negative. So if you have to happen to see something with a negative exponent, that will make it decrease. Why does it decrease? Because well, what did we say a negative is? We said that would be like one over e to the x. So it's just a difference in how to write it, but it means the same thing. Something between zero and one is gonna go down, but sometimes people choose to write a negative exponent instead of writing a fraction. So to start, let's just find a few values of e and use our calculator to see what happens when we plug it in because I think it's always good to practice before we get to the real problems. So I want you on your calculator to find the e, to put in the four, and it's always going to give you a decimal. The only time you're not gonna get a decimal is if you put in e to the zero. So we're gonna to have to approximate. So let's do three decimal places. I have 54.598. I wanna do the same thing, I just made it a little bigger. I wanna put in three e to the negative two. Again, let's do three decimal places. So this is 0.406. So immediately, let's look at an application then. So this function, C of t, two, is 250 e to the negative 0.114, models the amount of caffeine in milligrams a person has in their body t, after, t hours after drinking a cup of coffee. So let's use our calculator. Let's plug in these values, 1, 4, and 8, to figure out how much caffeine you'll have after you've drank this coffee. So we'll start with 250 e to the negative 0.14 times 1, and I think that's a good idea to go ahead and practice, do this with me, even if you have to stop me for a minute, and then come back and see what I got. All right, so I got 217, and let's do two decimal places this time, let's say 3, 4. If you are not getting the same value that I got, sometimes you may want to put parentheses around the exponent. This one probably came out the same, but just be careful as we go. So let's try again. After four hours, I have e to the negative 0.14 times four. So maybe putting it in this way might be helpful to you. You should get 142.8. And when I do two decimal places, I get eight zero. So what this says is we drink this coffee, we have 250 milligrams of caffeine. After an hour, it's dropped to 217. After four hours, it's dropped to 142, which is where you're like, oh, I'm getting tired, I better drink some caffeine again. In eight hours, let's put in 250 e to the negative 0.14 times eight. 
Now we have 81.57 milligrams of caffeine left. Right? So you can see this drop that's happening. We have this high when we first drink the coffee and then it's going lower, lower, lower throughout the day and hopefully by the time we're ready for bed, it's all gone. Let's take an example. The electric current I in MA in the circuit, which I didn't show below, is I equals 2.5 times 1 minus E to the negative 0.10T, where T is time in seconds. Evaluate I for T equals 5.0 MS and note that 1 MS is equal to negative 10 to the negative 3 seconds. Here's what we need to do. Even if all these words don't really sound familiar, we know that we need to put T into this function. Before we're able to do that, we need to convert T to the appropriate unit, which would be seconds. So let's start with we have 5 ms, which is millisecond, and we're going to do the conversion that 1 millisecond is equal to 10 to the negative 3 seconds. The units for the milliseconds disappear, and I have 5 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. It's up to you at this point if you would like to leave this as 5 times 10 to the negative 3, or if you want to change that over to negative 3 would mean 1, 2, and then the third number would be the 5. So remember we're counting to the right of the decimal place. So I put the decimal place and then 1, 2, 3, the third one is a 5. All right, let's plug that in. So i is equal to 2.5. I have 1 minus e to the negative. 0.1 times 0 0.005. Okay, so pay attention to the parentheses, be careful with them. Let's plug this in. I have 2.5 parentheses, 1 minus, and I'm hitting E, and maybe you need parentheses, you kind of have to learn how your calculator works, to the negative 0.1 times 0 0.005. And I got, let's do three decimal places, 0 0.001. This will be an MA because at the beginning it says I is an MA. Let's try another one. A medical research lab is growing a virus for a vaccine that grows at a rate of 2.3% per hour. If there are 500 units of the virus originally, the amount present after T hours is given by N equals 500 times 1.023 to the T. How many of the units are present after two days? All right. Again, here's this difference between T is in hours and they gave us two days. But this time, hopefully, we're a little bit better with it. Then we go two days and we know there are 24 hours per day. <clears throat> so I have 48 hours that we are trying to evaluate this function for. So n, the number of virus that's here now, will be 500 times 1.023 to the 48. This says now I have 1,489. Um, and we're just going to leave it like that because the virus, I want to count a whole unit. I can also look at how many places I had, right? I remember, we used to talk about significance and um, precision. So I had four places. So let's do four places. And this says that I now have 1,489 units of this virus. All right, so here we are back to value. The value of a bank account in which $250 is invested at 5% interest compounded annually is V is equal to 250 times 1.0500 to the T, where T is time in years. Find the value of the account in four years. So this time the time is given perfectly, it's in the right unit. We're going to put in 250 times 1.0500 to the fourth. Now this one's money, so I expect the answer to be expressed as money, so we're going to give two decimal places. So this is $303, and let's make that $0.88. Cent. 